Good evening and welcome back to Beethoven in the Twilight of the Enlightenment. Today we enter the 19th century and we're going to talk about a period that historians sometimes refer to as Beethoven's heroic period. And of course, uh, those of you who know the work on the screen, uh, the third symphony is titled the Eroica Symphony and Eroica actually means heroic. So this piece, I think, very much uh, responsible for the genesis of this, uh, this moniker, the heroic period. Before we get into music from the early 19th century and this very critical part of Beethoven's life, I want to just review a little bit of what we discussed last week. In our discussion of Beethoven's, call them early works, pieces from the 1790s, when remember Beethoven is still in his 20s, we looked at the Pathetique Sonata, sonata that dates from 1797-98, dedicated to Prince Lichnowsky. We're going to talk about him today. He was an important patron of Beethoven's until they quarreled, and he wasn't anymore. <laughs> Although he did try to reconcile with Beethoven, but Beethoven was having none of it. And that really, in itself, I think, tells us an awful lot about how Beethoven is revolutionizing the status and the role of the musician in society. In Mozart's day, musicians were essentially servants. In Bach's day, musicians were definitely servants. Bach was a servant to the Thomas Church in St. Thomas Church in Leipzig and to the consistory and the ecclesiastical authorities that ran the town. Uh, he was a, a servant to the Dukes of Weimar in the 17 teens. Mozart himself was a servant to the Archbishop of Salzburg, Hieronymus Colloredo. Not a good guy, or at least he's one of the real sinister characters in any music history textbook. The Archbishop of Salzburg is one of the most villainous characters because of the way he treated Mozart. It tells us an awful lot about how music and how society has changed when we consider that Mozart in the 1780s was chafing at the fact that he was seated at a feast below the salt next to the stable boys and the grooms. And he complains about this in a letter to his father. And Mozart would have been about 25 years old at the time, but old enough and smart enough and self-aware in a way that it would have been very clear to him that he was the greatest composer living in Europe at that time. And so for him, Mozart could not understand why he was being seated next to the guys who clean out the manure out of the stables. That didn't compute for him, and I think for us today it doesn't compute either. We would think of Mozart as having the place of honor on the dais, so to speak. Uh, and instead, he's seated next to the guys whose job it is to, you know, clean up the horses and make sure that the Lord of the Manor's coat is out and waiting for him to put on in the morning and brushed out. And for us, I think in our society, the way it's evolved since the 19th century, and I think in no small part thanks to Beethoven and, and the people who took his lead and, and um, embraced the model he had established, the musician becomes something far more than a servant. Musicians become demigods in a way, creators of art, people who have no parallel, no, have no equal in society because what they do is totally unique. Early in the 1800s, Beethoven, actually right around 1800, um, was sponsored, you might say, by this individual I, met, I mentioned earlier. Uh, he was actually a Prussian nobleman and had the title of prince. His name was Lichnowsky. And he paid Beethoven a stipend of about 600 gulden a year, which is a lot of money, enough for Beethoven to pay his rent and buy his food and his wine. Beethoven liked wine, probably got that from his father. His father was, uh, uh, unfortunately for, uh, for the Beethoven family, his father was a hopeless alcoholic and, and died rather young in his 40s. Beethoven was sponsored by this count. Now, what on earth would you give the count in recompense? Well, if you were lucky, if you were an, an aristocrat and you could sponsor a very uh, promising musician, they might pay you back in the only coin they had, which was to dedicate a work to you, and therefore you become immortalized in a way. So this count, excuse me, Prince Lichnowsky became sort of immortal because anybody who knows Beethoven and has studied Beethoven will know that name as one of the most important patrons and one of the most sponsors of Beethoven in this period, this heroic period. Their relationship came crashing down around 1805. Beethoven was over for dinner. And that was very typical back then. These aristocrats loved to have the artists over for dinner. 
and they could show them off, almost like a pet, and have them perform certain feats. And there's a story about Beethoven going over for a dinner, and at the time, this is during the Napoleonic Wars, this particular prince, Lichnowsky, has some French officers and high-ranking nobility over, and he's, he's trying to impress them, so he invites over his pet Beethoven, or so he might have regarded him. And he says to Beethoven, play for us. Now, Beethoven had been asked to do this many times at many different gatherings, and he had obliged. Beethoven was a famous improviser and would famously sit at the piano and either extemporaneously create on the spot or occasionally indulge the audience and ask for a theme or an idea, and then he would improvise on that. But on this particular evening, Beethoven's about 34 years old, 35 years old, he simply says one word to the prince. Nine. No. Now, you can't imagine Beethoven speaking that way or Bach speaking that way to someone who outranks him by several orders of magnitude in the social hierarchy. But Beethoven did it. The prince, as you can imagine, was thunderstruck by this response. Now, he's been embarrassed in front of his aristocratic guests, and he turns to his guests, and we can almost imagine him offering a weak smile and chuckling, perhaps, to try to diffuse the awkwardness and saying to Beethoven, he, his response was something like, Beethoven, do I have to remind you who I am and who you are? And Beethoven had a great response, and it's a response that inspired and galvanized generations after him. He says to the prince, what you are, you are by the accident of your birth alone. There have been a thousand princes before you, and there will be a thousand princes after you. There's only one Beethoven. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, needless to say, that was the end of his stipend. <laughs> Although it should be mentioned that had the prince wanted to be more vindictive, he could have been. Back in those days, in Vienna especially, the powers that were were terrified of what was going on in Paris in the previous decade what had happened in Paris and what was sweeping across Europe. Sort of B-flat major, but let's silence it because uh, this is E-flat major. We don't want to get a superimposed tonic and dominant. So Beethoven was living in a city where if, if the prince had wanted to, he probably could have had Beethoven severely disciplined for what amounts to what we would probably now call insubordination or something like that. At any rate, uh, Lichnowsky did not punish Beethoven other than to rescind his his salary that he was paying him. And uh, interestingly, he tried to rekindle his relationship with Beethoven years later, but Beethoven was not interested. By that point, he had moved on and made a new best friend in town, and it was none other than the youngest son of the emperor, uh, Franz II of Austria. His name was Rudolf. And so those of you who know, for example, the Archduke Trio dedicated to Rudolf as are a number of other pieces, including the Hammer Clavier Sonata, which we're going to talk about hopefully next week. Today we've got three pieces to look at. We're going to start by wrapping up our discussion of the Moonlight Sonata. We're then going to move on to the third symphony, and then we're going to spend the second half of the program talking about one of the most monumental, towering works in the whole canon, one of the best known works, but I think there's a lot to, left to be said about it, and that's the Fifth Symphony, one of the most recognizable, iconic, musical gestures. It's not a theme exactly. It's, it's more than that, and it's less than that at the same time. So we'll discuss uh, those two symphonies, number three and number five, in depth. Number three, we'll discuss the first movement. Number five, we'll hopefully get to all four movements. Before I uh, resume our study of the Moonlight Sonata, I would like to uh, open up the floor for questions, and we can we can uh, luxuriate in questioning about what we talked about last week or any questions about uh, repertoire to be discussed tonight. If it's something I'll get to later, then I'll just uh, say, I'll get to that later. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, they were hired servants, but they were servants all the same. Beethoven was a bachelor all his life, and uh, he was a, a rather slovenly bachelor, and no amount of help seemed to alleviate that slovenliness. Um, he had cooks, for example, and they were on a sort of a revolving door uh, system of, of uh, coming in and out because the, be Beethoven would fire them every six months and de declare that they were trying to poison him and uh, that he needed a new one. Same thing with maids and, and kitchen scullions and everybody else. Beethoven was a sort of a suspicious 
person, and as we'll see uh, in a moment when we look at the Eroica Symphony um, and we look at the Heiligenstadt Testament, not a, an, a particularly friendly guy. Um, so he did have servants. They did not last long often. Yeah. Great question. The question is about Beethoven's deafness, and we're going to get to that later on because by 1803-04, by the time of the Eroica Symphony, his hearing loss is, is pronounced and his hearing is significantly compromised. And as you mentioned with those late works, say by the time we get to the 1820s where it seems he's firing off one masterpiece after another, the Misa Solemnis, the late string quartets, the late piano sonatas, the Opus 111 sonata, and of course the Ninth Symphony, it seems that Beethoven's quality of, of his works gets better as his hearing gets worse. And in fact, by the time he writes his greatest works, or what some people would call his greatest works, he is stone deaf. How is that possible? Well, it can be answered in one word, and I'll elaborate on this over the next three programs. In fact, we'll talk a bit about it today when we discuss the Fifth Symphony. Um, it's not through vibrations. There are all sorts of myths about Beethoven that he would you know, s put his head to the piano and something like that, and, and that's, uh, as they say in Ireland, malarkey. Uh, that's, uh, choose, your, uh, choose your word, hogwash, poppycock, uh, nonsense. Um, he wouldn't have needed to do that, although it is a, a very, um, it's a very romantic idea that he's somehow connected with the earth or something like that, or he was in tune with physics or something, but it's, uh, it's false. Um, it would have been completely superfluous, even if it were true, because Beethoven didn't need to hear anything externally. He would have heard everything with what musicians call the inner ear. Most musicians, if you've even studied music, uh, if you took piano lessons or something, you can relate to this. Now I play that note, and let's say I know that's F. Now, I'm not Beethoven, and I don't have Beethoven's gifts, but if I know that this is F, and you said sing A, I would sing A. Let's go ahead and check that. Right? And if this is A, then this is D. How do I know that? I'm just using what they call relative pitch, relationships. Music is all about relationships. If I was blindfolded and somebody played a succession of notes, if they told me the first note, I could get the others. The difference is that for most mortals, they can't get that first note. Uh, they can't determine it. You'd need what's called absolute pitch or perfect pitch. Um, a really good musician might have absolute pitch and if they didn't have absolute pitch, it might not be necessary. You might have what's called exceptional oral recall. And that's what Beethoven had. He had absolute pitch, he had exceptional oral recall, and he didn't need to hear those sounds externally because he simply heard them in his inner ear the same way that everyone in this room is going to hear the recordings I play later. I had a, a professor in graduate school, Marty Boykin. Marty's probably 86 now or something like that. He's still doing well. Um, Marty and I worked together when he was about 80. And it was an independent study on tonal composition. He, he asked me to write a string quartet in the style of Haydn. So I write my string quartet in the style of Haydn. A month later, I bring him, you know, 16, probably, yeah. So we're talking about 65 pages of, of manuscript for all the parts. And Marty looks at it, and he's leafing through it. And he, so you can hear him sort of humming to himself a little bit. Now, Marty had smoked cigarettes for probably 40 years. So he had this raspy, very raspy voice, very pronounced, uh, very... Uh, if, if you hung out around Brandeis University in the early 2000s, it was a very iconic voice in the music department. And he looked at it, finished looking at it. It took him about probably eight minutes to look at it. He didn't say a word. We just sat there in his office, and he's just looking at it. Gets to the end, and he looks at me, and he says... Measure 137 should be a G sharp in the viola. <laughs> he just knew. He, he was hearing it in his head as he looked at it, the same way we would hear a stereo recording. That's a weird concept for most people. That seems more in the realm of hocus pocus or some voodoo ritual. How can you possibly do that? Well, uh, a great musician like, like uh, a Marty Boykin or certainly somebody like a Mozart or a Beethoven with their exceptional gifts of, of uh, pitch recognition would be able to do that. Um, and we'll see that when Beethoven is deaf, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect his ability to compose at all. What it does, of course, compromise is his ability to perform. He can still perform some solo repertoire if you're 
if you're deaf, you can still play solo stuff. You obviously can't play in a group. You're not going to be playing a concerto. You're not going to be playing chamber music. Uh, that kind of music is too fluid. It's too organic. It requires, that's, this is what chamber musicians practice. It's not just about the notes on the page. It's about attuning yourself to the people around you. And if you're deaf, you can't do that. It didn't stop Beethoven from trying. And of course, it resulted in some very embarrassing and very heartbreaking episodes for him, I'm sure. Um, another thing you can't do when you're deaf is conduct. That makes sense to probably everyone in this room. It did not make sense to Beethoven. And he attempted to conduct and kept conducting right up until the end of his life. In fact, some of you may know this story. When he finished the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven was conducting the Ninth Symphony. The musicians in the orchestra were specifically told not to look at him and to look at the assistant conductor and to ignore the maestro. And Beethoven was flaring his arms wildly. And when the orchestra finished, they finished ahead of him. <laughs> and he's still you know, flailing his arms around. And of course, the audience has burst into a rapturous applause. We're going to talk about this in week four, the whole uh, the mythology of the Ninth Symphony. But uh, the contralto soloist, whose name was Carolina Unger, went on to have a successful career in Italian opera in the 19th century, had to tap him on the shoulder to spin him around because he, he didn't know that the piece had finished and he didn't know that the audience was, was giving him a standing ovation. Um, so you can't play chamber music, you can't conduct, you can't really even play solo repertoire. It's, it's very difficult to play. But you can compose, no problem. And so he was able to do that simply using memory. And again, we call that oral recall, or in Beethoven's rare case, absolute pitch. About one in 10,000 people has absolute pitch in the Western world. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a kind of very nuanced question, uh, and it's a very delicate issue for some listeners. Um, we call this note A, right? And if uh, I were tuning this piano, I would, I would come over with a digital device, and I would you know, work the tuning peg until it registered exactly 440 hertz vibrations per second because that's the standardized pitch for the note A. In Beethoven's day, was that the case? And if it was the case in, say, Vienna, was it the case in Bonn or in Hamburg or in Paris? And the answer is no. Nowadays, and especially in the last 30 years, it's become very fashionable for orchestras who play early music, not Beethoven, but earlier music, especially Baroque music, Bach and Handel, to play and follow a lower standard of tuning, where in fact, everything they play is going to sound a half step down. So it would be like listening to a familiar piece, but just slightly shifted in its, in its coloration, you might say. So it doesn't bother me, and I think most, most listeners are probably not even aware of it. If I play Mozart, Can anybody tell what I did there? I didn't play it correctly. I played it in C sharp major. Mozart wrote exactly zero pieces in the key of C sharp or D flat. Um, it should be here. Now, some people say that these different keys have uh, different characters, different qualities. And in fact, in the 18th century, this was a very important uh, consideration for a composer when writing music. People would say that flat keys had a, a more depressing sound and therefore were more suited, suited for elegiac music or music that was somehow associated with tragedy or sadness and that sh sharp major keys uh, were associated with the opposite. For example, with Bach, Bach is very sensitive to this issue. Um, the key of C minor is associated with the the texts that deal with sleep, and it's the sleep of death. So it's flat minor. Uh, for Bach, the flatter you go, typically uh, with minor keys, the more tragic, the more lamentative. In the St. Matthew Passion, when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For Bach, that's Jesus at his most human, at his most frail, at his most uh, vulnerable. And so he sets that section in deep flat territory, E flat minor, and even touches of, of uh, A flat minor. And so um, for composers, they would choose these keys very carefully, at least in Bach's day, and I think in Beethoven's day as well. I think it's a harder 
case to make for Mozart. Mozart's music is so overwhelmingly based in C major, G major, D major, F major. It's really sort of one half of the circle of keys. He doesn't really go to the other half. Yeah. Yes, the doctrine of affections, uh, a, it was a, a principle that was established in the Baroque period that music should essentially establish a mood which is appropriate for whatever affect it's trying to convey. And I think definitely um, it's more pronounced when we look at vocal music, obviously. You're going to have text that you can connect it to and say, well, does this sound right? Uh, as we've said before, major keys tend to be associated with happiness and minor key sadness, but as we'll see with Beethoven, it goes well beyond that. But yes, I think Beethoven was a great student of the past, so the doctrine of affections, which is a, an early Baroque phenomenon, is something he would have known about, at least in, in practice. Great question. The question is, what about this modern behemoth in front of me, this, this um, gra baby grand piano, which, which weighs about 1,000 pounds and is, is made of uh, very sturdy materials. It's framed with iron. It's cross-strung inside. It has a very robust sound. Is it anachronistic or otherwise problematic to play Beethoven on this instrument? And the answer is not really. Beethoven was playing Broadwood pianos in the 1820s, which are more or less... Uh, capable of, of what today's pianos are capable of. Mozart's a different story, and Bach is an even bigger uh, scandal or, or uh, polarizing subject. There are people who say that you know, when you play Bach on a piano, you're being anachronistic because Bach never wrote for the piano. Well, to that I would counter with two arguments. One, Bach deliberately leaves his designations ambiguous or vague. He sometimes uses the word clavier. Clavier simply means keyboard. It doesn't denote a harpsichord. That would be clavicembalo. And it would have been something very specific. He doesn't say clavichord. He simply says keyboard. Um, so clavier übung simply means keyboard exercises or keyboard practice, you might say. And um, that's uh, argument one. Argument two, and I'll quote uh, Glenn Gould on this one. Gould basically said, Glenn Gould was a great champion of playing Bach on a piano. And he basically said, the piano confers advantages, expressive advantages, on the performer, so why not tap into that? Uh, not that there's anything wrong with a harpsichord, but the piano can do things that a harpsichord can't. That's why the piano supplanted the harpsichord and rendered it all but obsolete, except for to nowadays collectors and you know universities will have them for special concerts and groups, but the piano reigns supreme. And think about it this way, the piano was invented in 1700. It's still here, it's not going anywhere. And this piano is not so different from the one that was really uh, codified 170 years ago in the time of Chopin and Liszt. So, so uh, I don't think that playing Beethoven on it is problematic, nor Mozart. With Bach, you might encounter some friction, but not much. All right, speaking of the piano. Today, I want to connect an idea between the Moonlight Sonata and the Eroica Symphony. And that is the simultaneity of simplicity and complexity, and the way Beethoven is able to spin out a very simple idea and turn it into something tremendous in scope, very potent in impact on the listener. And we see this in the third movement of the Moonlight Sonata. Um, there are a few things which are important about this. Last week we talked about the Moonlight Sonata, 1801, Beethoven's hearing is probably deteriorated to some degree, but he can still hear. He wrote it and dedicated it to a student of his, the Countess Giulietta Dricciardi, who was uh, someone that Beethoven fancied very much, you might say, wanted to marry. But as we know, as we learned last week, he was not Ludwig von Beethoven. He was Ludwig van Beethoven. And as such, not having an aristocratic bearing, he could never hope to marry a countess. Nonetheless, she's immortal. Why? because she's the dedicatee of this piece. And anybody who ever looks at the score is going to see it right there under the title of the piece. Dedicated, or the German word would be gewidmet, to the Countess Giulietta Gicciardi. What Beethoven does here is important because it's going to have echoes. It's going to have shockwaves, ripples, that are going to affect later pieces. And that is, I'm going to suggest a very novel idea, which is to put the emotional thrust of the music not in the first movement, but rather in the last movement. Traditionally, classical music is comprised of various movements. A sonata has three movements. A symphony has four. If you've got three movements, usually you're going to put your, all of your 
your energy, all of the attention-grabbing material is going to be front-loaded so as to grab the audience's attention and keep them hooked. Beethoven certainly grabs our attention with the first movement, but as we said last week, the first movement, paradoxically, is slow. It defies the rules. The rules say that that's a popular ringtone. First movements are supposed to be slow. As we saw last week, Beethoven starts us off fast. Excuse me, the, the other way around. Uh, first movement is supposed to be fast. He starts us off slowly and gives us this rhythmic dissonance. Now keep that in mind because rhythmic dissonance is going to be an important part of the discussion with the Eroica. Now if we sort of zoom in and analyze that right-hand figuration, which is consistent throughout the piece, it's what we call an arpeggio. It's basically taking the notes of the chord and just stretching them out in a sequence. That's really the key of the piece, C-sharp minor. Beethoven's going to take this idea and he's going to transform it in the third movement into this demonic dash, utilizing the range of the piano in a way that would not be possible on a harpsichord or even on a Mozartian forte piano from the 1770s. So this idea is now going to become, starting in the low register, right? Do you see it's the same idea? It's, it's just three notes that comprise the chord, except now. And he's going to have those chords moving in sequence, and so the opening is going to sound a bit like this. So we're off to the races, right? And it's clear that he's, he's not messing around. This is a, a new kind of approach to writing piano music, dark in a minor key, but not sad. I don't think anybody would listen to it and describe it as sad. We might describe it as tumultuous, stormy, chaotic perhaps, energetic, filled with fire. When it starts to get going, when we get to the second theme, um, Beethoven does something very interesting, which is he brings back, remember our old friend from last week, the one-hit wonder, Mr. Alberti? He brings back the Alberti bass line, except now the Alberti bass line, which remember is, right, that sort of simple alternation that gives us the harmonic foundation. Now it's going to be something like this. Just, just, the, uh, just a, little, a little slice of the piece. Uh, I had a student this past semester who was really into, uh, really into Norwegian death metal. That was his preferred uh, style of music. And um, in a music theory four class, we were talking about this piece, and he was just amazed. He sat there transfixed, and he said to me, actually he raised his hand, and he said, Professor, did Beethoven invent heavy metal? And I think what he was getting at was this, this, this kind of music which is driven by rhythmic impulse, incisiveness, just as much as it is by melody or anything else. It's the rhythm that really grabs us. And when the, that second theme comes, we're in the obscure key now of G-sharp minor, by the way, where the leading tone is going to be F double sharp. And you're just racing away with the left hand. And when it gets going, the end of it, uh, let me see if I can pick up where I left off. 
it's relentless, and it's, so it's very demanding. It puts a new technical demand on the performer, and you can hear them sort of, when you get to these, keeping that measured and even is one of the, the challenges of playing that movement, especially when you're, Beethoven asks you to do a ridiculous things. He asks you at one point to do, do trills. Um, he might have asked you to do this, but he doesn't want that. He wants it in octaves. Do you see that? I have to do it with two fingers there. So when it gets going, You have to really count. Mm, ba, mm, ba, mm, ba, ba, mm, ba, mm, ba, ba. So these are some of the things we're going to see uh, in the Eroica Symphony, a piece that I think just as much as driven by melody is driven by rhythm. So let's talk about the Eroica Symphony. I mentioned a document last week that dates from 1802, October of 1802. It's, it's the Heiligenstadt Testament. And this is uh, a document that Beethoven wrote addressed to his brothers. And it's simultaneously a very heartbreaking document and a very inspiring document. And I think it's one that, as we said earlier, like so many aspects of Beethoven's life, was mythologized and turned into a source of inspiration for composers of the coming generations. In the document, Beethoven, for the first time, admits his deafness. And essentially, it's, it's penned to his brothers. But as we know, Beethoven is really thinking of posterity as he writes this, because as you'll see, there are some lines he includes, which makes it very clear that he knows Gesundheit. He knows that this is something that readers are going are gonna to pour through after he's dead. So it starts out. Well, oh, ihr Menschen, die er mich für feindselig, störisch oder misanthropisch haltet oder erklärt, wie Unrecht tut ihr mir, ihr wisst nicht die geheime Ursache von dem, was euch so scheint, mein Herz und mein Sinn waren von Kindheit und für... It sounds like a run-on sentence, Beethoven. What's going on here? Or is it uh, one of those German sentences that Mark Twain would have had a field day with? Well, German sentences can be very long. What Beethoven is essentially saying here is, oh, you, you men who find me to be malevolent or störrisch is uh, stubborn or misanthropisch, misanthropic, somebody who hates people. If you find me to be hateful or stubborn, if that's how you see me, he says, wie unrecht tut ihr mir, how you wrong me. You got it all wrong. Ihr wisst nicht die geheime Ursache von dem, was euch so scheint. You have no idea what's afflicting me, he's basically saying. Mein Herz und mein Sinn, my heart and my senses have always been inclined since childhood towards well-meaning, good, sort of good vibes, you might say. And selbst große Handlungen zu verrichten dazu, I always um, inclined towards good deeds. I always wanted to accomplish great things, he says. Aber bedenket nur das seit sechs Jahren, but now I have to come to face the reality that for six years now, I am a hopeless case. Uh, this is a good line. Durch unvernünftige Ärzte verschlimmert. I've been, he says here, um, <laughs> I've been handled by incompetent doctors. Sort of unvernünftige can mean sort of dumb. Dumb doctors. Year after year in the hope of getting better, but finally, I have to come to the conclusion that I have eines dauernden Übels. I have a lasting malady. So this is a, something I think everyone can relate to. When you get sick, what do you do? You tell yourself, ah, it's fine. It'll get better. Yeah, I'll just sleep it off. I'll, you know, take whatever remedy and I'll be better. And that must have been what Beethoven told himself for years. But here, at the age of 32, actually 30, not quite 32, here he is, and he says, there's really no way this is getting better. This is getting worse and worse. And we can all imagine the frustration of living with this malady. Uh, for a musician to be deaf, just about the worst curse, and Beethoven goes on to say that. In fact, 
one of the things he says is that he considers taking his own life, but he resolves not to because there's still music within him that needs to be written. Now, that's a very powerful statement. He's not resolving to live for loyalty to the emperor of Austria or, or a desire to make money or get rich and famous or to woo women with his talents or to raise children and imbue his talents and share his gifts with, with the next generation. He's not interested in that at all. He says, basically, I can't kill myself because I still have music to write. As we said last week, he has a destiny to fulfill. The passion sort of pours off the page. And um, I think that it's a good document to read in preparation for listening to the Eroica Symphony, which comes a couple of years later. Now, we're looking right now at a piano reduction. Now, if you're thinking, who would be crazy enough to try to take everything that, uh, that Beethoven wrote for an entire symphony orchestra, an enlarged symphony orchestra, and try to condense it down to two hands on a piano? Well, you can see at the top here, um, only one pianist in the 19th century, I think, would have been crazy enough to try this, and his name was Franz Liszt. Liszt, uh, a story for another day. We'll leave him for another day. Once again, simplicity reigns supreme at the beginning of this movement. We start out with two chords, which might be considered sort of noise killers, chords intended to silence the audience. Uh, this was very common in the late classical period. Mozart does this in his Paris Symphony, for example, start with a big, loud noise so that your audience shuts up. Beethoven chooses here for his key, E-flat major, which would go on to be a key that, since we've talked about it, some historians and musicologists would argue that E-flat is a key associated with heroism, with victorious sentiment. Look, for example, at Beethoven's last piano concerto, a piece we're going to talk about next week, the Emperor Concerto in E-flat major. Beethoven would write... Uh, a couple of piano sonatas in the key of E-flat major, and both, I think it's fair to say, have triumphant characters. Um, I don't think it's true for every composer, but I think that it's definitely true for Beethoven. E-flat seems to be a special key, and we see that in this third symphony. Beethoven's first two symphonies, comparatively, are rather ho-hum pieces. So you might say, nothing to write home about. They're Haydn-esque, especially number one, uh, clearly t showing that He's a product of the Enlightenment period, a product of the classical period. This symphony, not so much. There are, of course, classical elements, but we're going to start to see some very radical things being done here, uh, both harmonically and especially rhythmically. Let me call your attention to them. We start with the simple idea, once again, the simple idea of the triad, the arpeggio. This idea. You have to think about it this way. These three notes on most instruments are the most fundamental pitches. Uh, think of a bugle. All right, think of taps. It's all about these three notes because they form what we call the tonic triad. And that's exactly how Beethoven starts us out in the cello, so here in the left hand. Starts out with two big chords. And then we're off. And it's that wrong note, it's that wrong note in the left hand that comes in when the cellos and basses descend to C sharp. So And it's very clear there that Beethoven is, is creating a musical tapestry here, which is, I think, for most listeners, those who know the history of this piece, meant to epitomize one central concept, which will be the focus of this symphony and the focus of other pieces, including the Fifth Symphony, as we'll see. And that is the concept of struggle. It's a struggle between simplicity and complexity. It's a struggle between major and minor. It's a struggle between consonant on the beat, strong affirmation of the meter, and forces which are churning against the meter and distracting us as listeners, pulling us away from that waltz-like tempo of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's really, I think, uh, apparent, and, it, and Beethoven socks us with it in the first 10 seconds of the piece. We get that C sharp, 
and it's going to divert our attention. Of course, he's going to pull things back together. But as this opening section, which we call an exposition, moves on, you'll start to see that rhythmic craziness that I mentioned earlier. We see it even here. This is maybe a minute into the piece. We have one, two, three, 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 one, two, three uh, which you can see up here. And you're going to hear this. It'll be very pronounced when we listen to it, even if what is on the screen right now just looks like gobbledygook, uh, which I imagine for many it will. Um, here's a great example. When we count three, the strong beat should be on beat one, right? One, two, three, one, two. Ask any dancer. They'll tell you beat one has primacy. That's the beat that should be emphasized. Look what Beethoven does as we drive towards the end of the exposition here. He gives us a rest on beat one, so we're emphasizing beat two. So we're going to sound like this. Instead of doing one, two, three, one, two, three, he's going to emphasize every other beat. So it will sound like this. One, two, three, two, one, three, two. And then your ear starts to hear one, two, two, one, two. One, two. I get it. We're in two, but we're not. We're always in three. All of this is to say that it would have presented a tremendous challenge to any musician playing in the orchestra back then, and I feel bad for those people because Beethoven <laughs> gave them, first he gives them something that's, and then he berates them, and Beethoven was notorious for berating his, his uh, orchestra players when they couldn't handle this incredibly complex music he was giving them. So uh, we'll listen to just the exposition here and then perhaps a bit of the development section because there are some really wonderful moments. You'll notice where, where I'm going to pause it, we're going to get to uh, a, a part where uh, it will sound like it's wrapping up and then Beethoven is going to hit us with this really dissonant, really sour chord. Sometimes people have referred to it as the, this brutal sonority, this very ugly sonority. And it seems, on the surface, inexplicable. Why would any composer who wants his audience to go home happy and whistle that tune and and uh, enjoy the sonorous delightfulness of his music. Why would Beethoven do what he does here, which is to end this exposition section with, with these crashing dissonances? You know, he gives us, essentially, it's this chord against this chord. Almost sounds atonal in a way, and if you look at the score, it's just this crunchy vertical combination of notes just parked one on top of another. And it's wonderful in a way because, as we said earlier, if your objective is to convey tension, to convey conflict, um, this piece was originally dedicated to Napoleon, as we said last week, but Beethoven became very disenchanted with Napoleon, felt betrayed by Napoleon. When Napoleon crowned himself, he famously exclaimed to Ferdinand Ries, he said, so he too is just a man, and now he will trample on the rights of everybody in Europe and serve his own ambitions above anything else. Beethoven really resonated with the ideals that Napoleon represented when Napoleon was calling himself first consul. Remember, we saw that in his conflict with Prince Lichnowsky, right? That Beethoven was bucking against the system, chafing against that same system that had, that had irritated Mozart so much and driven Mozart to join the Freemasons in the mid-1780s. Beethoven, I think, identified with, with that sentiment very much with the Masons and to some degree with the Illuminati who were a real group back then, not, not, not just uh, some shadowy entity. So if we can get the lights, um, we'll listen to this. Did you hear that at the end there? It's sort of crunchy, scratching sound that we get from the superimposition of really two entirely separate chords. It's almost a polychord, uh, which is a concept that we really more associate with Charles Ives and Beethoven, but there you have it. I want to point out a, another section uh, in the development, so we'll just listen to another moment uh, where you'll hear the music building up again, rhythmically, completely all over the place, almost never following that one, two, three, one, two, three. He's, he's consistently, uh, I think, giving us music which is in direct opposition to the prevailing time signature. So just listen to this section in the development. I mean, what's going on there? Now, for us today, it's not so ambitious, or at least compared to much of the music written after it. It doesn't seem as radical. But imagine being in the audience in that first decade of the 19th century and hearing this, watching those musicians struggling to count and to play the parts correctly. 
Beethoven, I mentioned Ferdinand Ries, his, his assistant and close confidant of his, was sitting next to Beethoven at the premiere. And Ries became very animated in this section. And he yelled out to Beethoven during the concert. He said, can't those damn horn players count? In other words, Ries thought that something was wrong, that what was being played had to be incorrect. Because how could you place those accents consistently, so consistently for such long stretches in the wrong places? And that's exactly what Beethoven does here. So this symphony, perhaps not as well known as the fifth or the ninth, but I think maybe more radical than either if you put it in its historical context. Now Beethoven was clearly thinking of this in terms of a program. It had a character that it was meant to evoke and depict. And perhaps there were sort of meta themes, you might say, uh, ideas he was trying to develop. As I mentioned earlier, conflict often uh, cited in the scholarship as being the driving force here. And that's why we get those crunchy dissonances. That's why we have, you know, where the, we just wound up, where we're, we're something like this. <laughs> It's just wild. It's so out there. And it's just wonderful. Now, while we do have a program for the Third Symphony, or, or uh, more of a substantial program than any other Beethoven symphony, say for maybe the Sixth, the Fifth Symphony is a piece that doesn't have a really defined program, but it's one that invites interpretation. Now, when I say it has a program, I mean a story, some sort of concrete image or idea, tableau, or person, place, or thing that the composer means to evoke. With the Sixth Symphony, which, by the way, premiered on the same concert uh, as the Fifth Symphony. In fact, the Sixth Symphony came first. So the ears of Europe heard the Sixth Symphony before they heard the Fifth Symphony. The Sixth Symphony has a very bucolic theme. In fact, we call it the Pastoral Symphony. And it has, it's set in the key of F major, and it has this wonderful quality that evokes being in a sunlit field in a meadow relaxing and hearing the birds chirping and the leaves swaying in the breeze. I don't think you could say that about the Fifth Symphony. Fifth Symphony has perhaps the opposite uh, antithetical effect in its sound. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the first movement. I want to talk about the other movements because I think that they're more important in a way. What is the traditional interpretation for this symphony? It's the symphony that everyone knows because it starts with that famous gesture. <laughs> Three short notes, followed by a long note, right? Short, 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 long, short, 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 long. Harmonized in the simplest way. Filled with pregnant pauses, right? What we call a fermata or fermata, which is a, a stop. So you start like this. It's a very unusual way to begin a piece. The first movement is well known. And there are some things about it that I could point out. For example, how just when you think that uh, the theme is going to return in what we call the recapitulation, Beethoven has the whole orchestra cut off. And he has this melancholy, almost, uh, almost funereal sounding oboe solo that comes in. A solo oboe in a, in a symphony, very unusual. And it comes in, and of course, that is going to lead into the build-up to the ending. Right when we think it's going to end, Beethoven swerves us yet again and gives us what we call a coda, a long coda here, where he introduces new thematic material. And the first movement is not especially long, probably no more than seven minutes with a repeat of the exposition, perhaps eight. Um, and it ends decisively in the key of C minor. Like this. <laughs> Something like that. Back and forth. Taking that rhythm from back at the end. Well, what's really remarkable about this symphony is the way Beethoven takes that motif, that three short note plus one long note motive, which sometimes historians call the fate motif, as we'll see Beethoven was asked about that that uh, very insistent motive, and he, he supposedly said that 
the motive was supposed to represent fate knocking at his door, destiny calling, that sort of idea. Now, there's some debate as to whether Beethoven actually said that or whether it was invented by his very creative and, uh, and um, prone to prevarication secretary, a guy named Anton Schindler. Schindler was someone who sort of weaseled his way into Beethoven's inner circle, made himself very indispensable to Beethoven. Um, and when Beethoven died, Schindler tried to make himself seem very important by making up all sorts of stories about how close he was with Beethoven, how Beethoven confided in him. And he wrote a Beethoven biography, which we know is riddled with inaccuracies and flat out lies. Nonetheless, whether or not Beethoven actually described it as fate knocking at his door is irrelevant. He might as well have said it because it fits. And, and that's, uh, I think, the way that people perceive it. What's remarkable here is not just this first movement. It's that he takes this motive and buries it, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, in each of the three remaining movements so that it becomes a sort of binding agent that brings the whole symphony together. So for example, if you know the second movement, we get this theme and variations in A-flat major. And when it cadences, you'll hear it do this over and over again. Well, if you think about it, it's slowed down quite a bit. But isn't this? Isn't that the same rhythm? In fact, when it, there's another moment where it changes keys and it does this. So you'll hear it like this. Isn't that just the fate motif slow down? Bum, 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 bum. Three shorts plus one long. Now, that second movement is a double theme in variations. There's a lot of content there. We won't listen to it. But I want to listen to the third and, and a little bit of the fourth movement. The third movement is perhaps one of the most memorable parts of this symphony. Beethoven marks it in the score as a scherzo, and that word is a little bit misleading because, of course, for you Italian speakers know that scherzo suggests something funny, right? It's just something comical, a joke. Um, there's nothing really funny about this movement. All right, maybe there's one thing that's funny about it. It's the shortest of the four movements. It's perhaps four minutes in a traditional performance. And Beethoven's going to start us out with the low instruments playing up a theme that marches like this. Very fast in a triple meter. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So you start. So we start with this ascending arpeggio, and then this funny note, and then and then the brass comes in. Now Beethoven calls for trombones here for the first time in a symphony, and he asks the brass to play this theme. Sounds a bit like this. Well, if the second movement presents us with the fate motif in a kind of subtle way, where it's in a major key and slowed down, the third movement, there's nothing subtle about it. Here, the brass is roaring, and that rhythm is on full display, right? It's that same, same rhythm. Here, it's now modulating between two keys, between C minor, and between, of all keys, E flat minor. Once that section closes out, it's very short. It's about a minute and 40 seconds. The basses and cellos are going to strike up a new theme. And this is where the humor comes in. And you'll see this on the screen in a moment. 
Beethoven asks the basses and cellos to play this theme that is imitative and polyphonic. So it's going to start out with them playing bum ba ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba dum ba pi ba pi ba ba ba, and then the other voices will imitate that theme. At one moment, though, you'll notice that at a certain point, the basses and cellos will try to play that theme, and then they will abruptly stop like this ba 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 da ba da ba ba da ba da ba da ba. And as we say, third time is the charm, and so on the third time, ba da 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 da deep da. When we get to the end of the movement, in about three minutes, I'll pause it and I'll say a bit about how Beethoven transitions to the finale, and then we'll wrap up. We get to the end of the third movement. Interesting thing about this, there is no break between the third and fourth movements. That's highly un unusual, uh, this idea of creating a bridge between movements so that, really, uh, they're totally connected in performance. And what Beethoven does here is, is to seize on the idea of tension by way of a pedal tone. So notice that this blue note here that represents the note C natural is going to be sustained throughout. And if you listen to what the, what's going on, it just seems like that C lingers there in the low register, like this. And it goes on like that. And then a violin comes in. Continues to climb like that, up and up and up. And you'll notice that it changes very subtly. The C stays. This stays constantly. And building upon it, you're going to get some enigmatic notes. Stuff like that. And then you're going to see the note E natural, here represented as a red note. And it's going to give this sort of pop of color and this wonderful transition from minor to major to this. Do you hear that difference? Here's E flat. And here's E natural, the red color. And it's going to build up to this chord. Now we're into the fourth movement. And if you listen and break down that fanfare, right? Just an arpeggio, where we started today, right? Taking the simplest idea. When he runs up the scale, what do you notice about this? This one's subtle. It's that same fate motif, isn't it? Ba da ba bum, ba da ba bum. Isn't that the same as to do this? It's very subtle, it's disguised, but it's there. You'll hear it when the second movement, when the second theme, excuse me, comes in. Ba da da dum, ba da da dum, ba da da dum. Ba da da dum, ba da da dum, ba da da dum, ba da da dum. Three short notes plus one long note. We'll listen to the next, uh, just this transition, another 30 seconds, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. So here. And you can see there. So we'll uh, we get the lights on, we'll wrap it up. Yes. Well, the last movement is, is like eight minutes long, so. Um, now that we're in, I'll, I'll play a little bit of the ending because, as you can see, there's, there's a lot that happens here. But one interesting thing that happens is how Beethoven ends the piece. And it generated, I think, uh, no small amount of controversy back in those days. People were curious why, after this incredible journey that he's taken us on, he chooses to end the symphony with an endless restatement of C major over and over again. For those who know how the symphony ends, you know it basically does this. Bonking us over the head with C major. And, and what I would say about that is that it's, it's critical to understand why he does that. And I don't have a, a perfect, flawless, empirically true answer. But I have, I think, an interpretation that makes sense. This piece is all about the transition from minor to major. It's a 35-minute journey from C minor, where the symphony starts, 
Right? Ending in the first movement. C minor. This, the darkness of C minor. And not just that it's, it's C minor, but it's C minor with all sorts of dissonances. C minor with that very tragic, lamentative oboe solo towards the end. C minor with that very expressive coda. And the fact that he completely flips that C minor 180 degrees and chooses to end the symphony, not in C minor, but in C major, a key that has sort of the opposite effect on the listener. And we just heard a little bit of it right now. When it transitions, when that, how many people felt when you saw that red note, that E natural? You just feel like the clouds have parted and all is right with the world. And so maybe this is a, a viable interpretation. I'm not saying this is the, the authoritative, empirically true, 100% unambiguous way to hear this piece. But perhaps Beethoven was trying to weave a narrative that goes something like this. The insistence of C minor and that fate motif, which, which brings up and conjures up the notion of destiny, fate, providence. C minor might be thought of as being the key of despair, being the key of, of suffering and gloominess and anxiety and isolation and depression and all of the negativity that was bound up with with the consequences of Beethoven's deafness and what it had done to his personal life, shattering his relationships, shattering his ability to interact with most people, certainly his ability to, to uh, engage in romances, his ability to, to uh, father children. All of those dreams went out the window with his deafness. And perhaps it's possible that in the Fifth Symphony, C minor is meant to represent that, that idea. And yet this is the Beethoven who in the Heiligenstadt Testament says he's not going to take his own life. It's not possible for him to do that because, you see, he's got work to do. And maybe, just maybe, that transition from C minor to C major, which is unprecedented. Mozart never does that. You don't start a symphony in one key and end it in another. That's against the rules, folks. As we've seen, Beethoven is not so interested in the rule book. He's rewriting the rule book. And that transition from C minor to the parallel key of C major with the trumpets and trombones and the percussion and that endless insistence on C major for the last minute and a half of the piece, maybe Beethoven was trying to send a message to the world. Maybe he was making a statement. Just when you think you've been sucked down to the deepest pit of despair. Just when you think that there's no more sunlight left in the world, the clouds part, the sun comes out, and all is right. Any challenge can be tamed. Any obstacle is ultimately surmountable. Beethoven would inspire the next hundred years of composers. And one of the things that's consistent in their ruminations and reflections on his legacy and what he contributed is that Beethoven never gave up, never took no for an answer, and pushed himself to the absolute limit of what he was capable of and pushed music past the limits of what people were capable of understanding or appreciating in that time. There was this, uh, a poll of sorts that was done after the premiere of the Eroica Symphony, not this one, but Symphony Number no. 3, and they found that about 10% of the audience thought that the piece was horrible. About 10% thought it was brilliant and 100 years ahead of its time. And the other 80% had no clue what was going on. <laughs> on that note, I will see everybody next week where we'll look at the, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing everybody next week. We're going to look at some late Beethoven piano sonatas, string quartets, and the Emperor Piano Concerto, Concerto Number no. 5 in E-flat major. <laughs>